so during the session, Becca and I are going to um, outline a new program of work that we've been working on for the last sort of 18 months, 20, 24 months at our end of the week. Uh, it builds fairly substantially on the, it, it builds on the plans that the urban poverty and informality work that's been underway in, in our eyes and since, well, since we've been a human settlements group. Uh, and I guess it's, it, it, when I start, so I, I really found myself in particular, I'm the, the longest standing full-time member of the human settlements group. Uh, and that wasn't the case when I joined 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, I guess when I started, the work was moving, the work of our partners was moving from solely focusing on the poverty of informality uh, to thinking about adaptation and how upgrading the informal settlements in sub Saharan Africa and Latin America could also in incorporate or, or would also incorporate um, a focus on resilience. Um, but I guess for most of the time that I've been here, uh, there's been very little focus on decarbonisation uh, and mitigation in informal settlements. And I think that's principally because people that live in informal settlements have very small carbon footprints, so why should they be burdened with decisions um, around decarbonisation? The programme of work that we're establishing at the moment with our partners uh, is, is, is principally around this idea there are generation defining investments in cities that are happening at the moment and they're focused on mitigation. And if low income and informal communities are excluded from those discussions and those decisions and those investments, we know that poverty and inequality will be exacerbated. Uh, so that's the starting point for where we're at. Um, uh, and we're just going to have a bit of a conversation about how, how and why we've been reaching those agendas. And then we're going to hand over to um, our colleague and partner, Joshua Simba, who's over from Zimbabwe, and Flo, who's online from Buenos Aires. Yeah, so this program has really led to really fruitful conversations, both with colleagues within IAED as well as partners around the world. And um, also very often productive kind of tensions and conflicts about where we put our attention and where we put our resources. But we maintain that it's actually very important for us to begin the work to link kind of a global climate justice agenda as well as urban climate justice with mitigation and uh, zero carbon cities. And this, it's taken a while to get here for, for the past couple, couple of decades. Climate justice has really remained at this global level where the default subject was also a nation state representing kind of very abstract populations. And it doesn't mean there haven't been efforts to localize climate justice. There have been very commendable ones and they've focused um, for good reasons on adaptation. Um, and uh, that makes sense because poorer populations in poorer countries disproportionately uh, suffer the, the effects of climate change. We, uh, as Anna was saying, so much of the drive and especially finance is focused on mitigation. And, and so we believe that if we, um, continue to operate in this mitigation adaptation silos, we run the risk of leaving behind low income populations as we kind of make very definitive decisions about what cities are going to look like and how we plan economic development. In fact, mitigation investments might end up subsidizing sustainable living for the middle and higher income earners in cities while they either ignore or potentially displace low income populations. And what we are trying to do is kind of moving beyond uh, a conversation about co-benefits. So very often when we see climate policy experts talking about innovations in cities um, and, and, and why we need to implement certain uh, sustainable practices, it's uh, sold with a series of co-benefits to make cities more inclusive, greener, and healthier. But we would like to kind of start these conversations and with the priority of justice and equality as intertwined with decarbonization. And we think that this is important, definitely from a normative uh, perspective, but also because efforts to decarbonize simply won't be successful if you don't have a majority of population supporting policies. 
and do that. So you need to sell solutions that kind of operationally serve the interests of middle class of the working poor. And we see there are a lot of unmet needs and inequalities. So we're looking at investment needs of six trillion US dollars to uh, kind of provide adequate infrastructure to more than 1 billion people living in informal settlements. How can we leverage momentum and finances to respond to these needs? Uh, a, a kind of a staggering statistic is 80% of urban buildings and infrastructures that will exist in 2050 in that content are yet to be built. So how can we ensure that investments in a sustainable built environment benefit everyone in the city? Might we be so bold to suggest that investments should disproportionately benefit the urban poor, since the urban poor disproportionately suffer the consequences of climate change? And I guess, yeah, just in addition to that, um, I guess most uh, lots of people that are familiar with IRD's work know that we have a long history of, of decentralizing, of working on the need to decentralize development finance, to decentralize climate finance. Um, uh, Adichie's work focus, focuses uh, quite quite strongly on the need to decentralize our adaptation finance to make sure that it, it gets to um, communities and local governments who are on the front line of climate change. But we know that 90% of, of climate finance is actually part of litigation. And the idea that we haven't been able to develop a narrative or a framework with our partners that's focused on getting that finance to summit raising programs, to housing, to basic services, where there are huge deficits and an absolute asset investment is essential. That's kind of what's been motivated here. Um, our work in this actually started in Latin America. Uh, well, that gives the opportunity to start thinking about this. Uh, and that's kind of how to join the group and um, let us talk a bit more about that project. Sure. So uh, we have a few kind of initiatives looking at the, the largest of which is um, uh, an IKI funded project uh, in Latin America. Uh, we've worked with a consortium of partners to set up five urban labs in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Teresina and Recife in Brazil and in Mexico, Leon and Navalcan. And this project kind of is using urban labs with multi stakeholder um, participants from communities, from civil societies, private sector, uh, municipal government, as, as well as academia to kind of define uh, problems that they address in. Uh, and to deliver kind of catalyst solutions that are aligned with zero carbon trajectories. And what's interesting here, kind of like reflecting on and both kind of, kind of normative, analytical, and operational patients, is that we really we can see the different approaches from the urban labs operating in different political contexts with different kind of governing cultures, as well as different setups of what participation looks like and how it feels like and how decisions are made. And so, and this has led again to a lot of productive um, tensions, not only within each urban lab, but also when we host exchanges across geographies. So they can exchange, okay, what does inclusion and participation mean in now on Mexico? versus in Vigevente, which is an informal settlement in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And um, this is kind of very much the beginning of a question, uh, of a conversation, uh, which we, we, we hope we can build on across future projects and programs. Um, and we're trying to kind of kindle that, that process at the moment uh, by using a series of global and regional dialogues. Uh, because we, we've been doing this work with partners in Latin America, but we also have a, a really strong network of partners in Sub-Saharan Africa, who we've been working on issues of urban poverty and adaptation with for some time. Uh, so over the next sort of two to three months, we're hosting a series of um, uh, regional dialogues where we're trying to, well, we're kind of trying to unpick the, the relationship or the potential relationship between a broader identity of climate action that includes decarbonisation and social justice. Um, and to dispel this myth that low income urban communities don't have a role to play 
in decisions or investments related to mitigation. Um, what's been really interesting in the last couple of weeks, because we've just we've just hosted the first Sub-Saharan like, dialogue, is that we're considering how progressive climate action or focus on mitigation could potentially crack open challenges around tenure. Um, or how local knowledge and local building materials can be brought to the table, given the debates that are kind of largely European driven around um, uh, potential timber systems that are made out of timber. So how can we bring local knowledge in? How can we think about, of, like, about the availability of local resources to not only upgrade in a sustainable way, but in, in, a, in a way that kind of contributes to decarbonisation? Uh, linking back to the theme of the day, uh, we're going to highlight uh, a special issue in vital environment organization that's going to be published next spring um, on this exact theme. And we're going to host a couple of abstract workshops on that. Um, and I guess just to emphasize anyone's interest in the theme, then we'll host an abstract workshop in English and also in Spanish that you can submit in Spanish, Portuguese, or English or French. Uh, so if you're interested in the theme and you'd like to kind of test and abstract out with us, uh, we'd really welcome your participation there. Uh, but before, I guess, unless you've got anything else to add, I'd like to invite George Masimba to the, to the panel uh, to talk a bit about uh, climate, the impacts of climate change in uh, important settlements in Hawaii. Jewish did prepare a PowerPoint, but it's my fault. It's not up there. We've had to deck disconnect all the audio and I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is George Mastimba. I'm from Dial and Shorter, an organization that is working in Plum Village International. And uh, I'm going to go through a presentation that will focus on the intersection between climate change and urban informality or informal settings in particular. So as I indicated, uh, work with the SBI and uh, in, in terms of the work that we do, it's uh, grounded around the three key principles or approaches uh, in terms of community managed savings, uh, Data community based data collection processes, and then there's the learning or continuous reflection processes. And these uh, approaches have been refined over the years by the SDI. And we think they are very key in terms of the current topic that we are talking about in terms of dealing or addressing issues to do with climate change, in particular, focusing on informal settlements. And in terms of uh, the impact of climate change in informal settlements, based on the experience from our colleagues in Iran and other countries under the SDI, we, we look at this uh, challenge from three dimensions, obviously, issues to do with uh, extreme temperatures, issues to do with flooding, issues to do with uh, droughts, in terms of how these impact on informal settlements. Considering the vulnerabilities or the challenges that you find in informal settlements. So, for example, you notice that as a result of climate change, impacts, or others, uh, impacts from climate change, you have uh, serious issues to do with livelihoods, erosion of incomes in informal settlements due to loss of assets, loss of property, destruction of housing. And in addition to that, we also notice a uh, destruction of infra infrastructure is a result of uh, the flooding, clogging of uh, drains, for example, as part of some of the uh, effects that you notice in, in informal settlements. And in addition to that, droughts, recurrent droughts, also have a bearing or impact in informal settlements in terms of drying up of uh, water sources and also lack of water in informal settlements. And this has implications also on, on social issues. For example, uh, whenever we have ch challenges to do with water, that also presents an added burden on women in terms of uh, collection of water. They have to walk longer distances. And also, in addition, related to that, 
There are also social issues. If some of these communal water problems are so you have uh, gender-based violence. And uh, during COVID, for example, we have very disturbing cases of uh, sex for water, for example, communal water points for women, for girls to access water. Uh, in terms of health issues in informal settlements, we talk of waterborne diseases in instances where, where you are flooding, a uh, vector borne diseases in terms of flooding again, uh, malaria, like that. Then also more nutrition due to food insecurity exacerbated by drought, drought conditions. So all these impacts, all these issues, you, you consider them against the backdrop of the conditions in informal settlements where basic services are a challenge, so social services also are a challenge. And then you begin to imagine the kind of vulnerabilities, the kind of challenges that are faced by informal settlements in terms of climate change. Having talked about these impacts in informal settlements, I pictures that I, I had in my PowerPoint just to illustrate some of these impacts. I will proceed to then talk of why is it important to connect climate change actions with, with urban upgrade or an improvement of informal settlements. Like I indicated, informal settlements constitute some of the most vulnerable, vulnerable parts of the cities with the housing and infrastructure precarity. And that then makes it's very imperative to, to connect climate actions with upgrading. In fact, climate change responses or urban upgrading in particular contribute towards adaptation and mitigation, mitigation measures. For example, coming up with the communal water points, as an example, coming up with innovations such as the waterless sanitation toilets, as an example. All these are innovations that fall under urban upgrading but at the same time contribute towards addressing the challenges that communities face in informal settlements. Then thirdly, there are very huge opportunities for connecting with community-led uh, experiences around, for example, community managed funds and the end scaling of uh, climate change action. In other words, imagining climate actions or imagining upgrading in climate change action is connected Allows, to, allows us to then uh, begin to develop approaches or climate actions from below, from the bottom up. As we talked about the potential connections between climate change actions or climate actions in our community, what are the challenges that we have noted in our experience working with cities, working in informal settlements? So firstly, uh, it's important to note that there's very limited, I, I, I like the presentation on data, because my, my challenge is also speak to that as well. There's very limited uh, evidence and institutional capacity, in particular within government, or the central and local government level, which helps to illustrate the intersections between climate actions and informal settlement activities. So assuming we had a lot of data, institutional capacity, within government at both levels, central and local government level, that would then make it very powerful and imperative to act or to ensure that climate change actions are mainstream in terms of how we imagine and provide services in our cities. And yet, as we speak, or in, based in our context, there's very limited evidence, there's very limited data and institutional capacity. And then, therefore, at a policy level, the connection is not been very sufficiently articulated and pronounced because there isn't that information, there isn't that evidence to really stress and highlight the connections between the two. And related to that, informal settlements are also not recognized, hence the challenge. So the default uh, mode for local governments, for city managers, is to demolish informal settlements. And that presents a huge, huge challenge in terms of how they do the develop of climate actions when informal settlements are not being acknowledged or at least considered as part of the city. Then deepening urban poverty also uh, in, in, in many of the contexts in sub uh, in, in the global south also make it even important, difficult because of issues to do with erosion of disposable incomes and uh, hence savings, which 
typically Kushian communities in terms of uh, the adverse impacts of climate change. Then there is also the element of the huge costs that are associated with transitions to sustainable infrastructure. That, uh, for example, we talk of uh, solar power and uh, lighting in, in formal settlements. Much as that pathway is, is important and is desirable, increasingly what we are noticing is that that transition to sustainable infrastructure option is not an easy path. They are very expensive in terms of the initial costs that are associated with transitioning from a non-sustainable methods to sustainable options such as solar. Then lastly, in terms of the challenges, as a result of lack of data that I talked about earlier, there is also lack of policy frameworks to support specific climate actions. For example, decentralized energy solutions, decentralized infrastructure, or off-grid infrastructure options. All these typically speak to or are resonate with uh, sustainable uh, infrastructure. And yet we don't have adequate policy frameworks within our city that then embrace or incorporate these alternatives. Then having talked about challenges that, that exist, it's also important perhaps to flag some of the opportunities that are there in terms of uh, the intersections between climate change and the informal settlement upgrade. So there is, in terms of the SDI experience, there is massive grassroots infrastructure that has been set up in terms of organized communities that are saving, that are regularly meeting, that are engaging with each other, learning together, which presents an opportunity in terms of making sure that we can come up with local, locally led, for example, uh, adaptation or local, localized climate actions that are designed or uh, informed by communities themselves. So there's that massive grassroots infrastructure in place. Then secondly, there's also massive experience around community late data connection in terms of STIs experience. And, uh, and I'm glad Smooth has also talked about that. So essentially, what, what I'm saying is that it's important for any climate actions to also involve, in, informed by uh, community knowledge, by experiences or by those, uh, who are living this reality on a daily basis. So drawing or connecting with community knowledge also presents opportunities in terms of dealing with adverse impacts of climate change. Then as, as part of SDI, what we've also been doing is also experimenting around issues to do with co-managed co uh, funds as a way of creating alternative innovative financing mechanisms that can potentially link with the global findings that seeks to address the adverse impacts of uh, climate change. For example, we have what we call community loan funds that are operated, administered, and governed by communities in terms of using uh, savings as a way of ensuring that those funds are resourced. But they are not only being resourced by communities, we have also used those uh, community managed funds or city level funds to also kind of leverage uh, resources from the state, leverage resources in particular from city government. And the beauty about that is that besides that, besides creating uh, or uh, creating additional resources that can potentially uh, help in terms of up, uh, upgrading interventions, they also create inclusive me governance mechanisms that can begin to potentially uh, inform the manner in which resources flow in terms of priorities for upgrading, in terms of priorities for climate action. And then lastly, there's also a history of engagement with the state. I think somebody talked about the opportunities or potential for linking with the state. I think it's, it's, it's from the, on the basis of the experience of SDI, there's been a lot of collaboration or collaborative work that has been undertaken with the state, in particular focusing on local authorities. And we think that presents opportunities for building collaborations or also even scaling initiatives that have been undertaken by communities in terms of also 
even building trust, uh, even also opportunity for building state capacity and creating opportunities for collaborative, collaborative actions that can reorient approaches towards informal settlements. Considering that I mentioned that the default response usually to informal settlements is usually uh, demolitions, evictions, etc. So we then uh, begin to think of collaborations, partnerships, that also is scope for ensuring that more inclusive approaches to dealing with informal settlement are adopted, are employed as part of climate responses. I think with those few remarks, thank you. Questions after um, Flo's presentation. So we're going to move from Harare all the way over to Buenos Aires now. Uh, Flo Coley's um, ID Red Latina, which is a sister organization of ours, we've technically working together since the 90s. Um, have you got Flo's presentation? If you're there, Flo, I'm going to yeah, hand it to you and then we'll, we'll have a, a pause of conversation about both, both case studies. Hello. Hi, hello. Yes, hello. Do you hear? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Florencia Almanzi from IDD America Latina. We are based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And as Tucker mentioned before, we are working together in, in this project, together with Mexico and Brazil. And I, I think I have a presentation. If you can share. Can you see it? Morgan was telling me that he was. Yeah, it's up to you. You can see it. Hold on one second. Sorry. Okay. Well, we. <coughs> We are asked to think in two questions, how to link climate change, decarbonization with uh, the situation in informal settlements. Uh, that's the first uh, question we, we want to share. Uh, we think about five priorities that um, can explain why to link these, these issues. The next, please. Um next. First of all, uh, it's the matter of growth of the cities and growth of informal settlements. Uh, we all know uh, that uh, gram uh, most of the population in the world and also in that in the south, the global south and in Latin America, 25% of the population is living in informal settlements, um, 29% in Latin America, but uh, we have 45% uh, of the population in Nicaragua and 15% of the population in Argentina living in informal settlements. So there's a, a lot of uh, investment uh, to make in the next year uh, in these parts of the, in the cities in the informal settlements. Uh, the other thing is the inequality in the cities. Um, you know, Buenos Aires is the richest city in the country, and this is the situation you can see. Uh, that the informal settlements have in, in the middle of the city of Buenos Aires. The same is happened in all the cities of the country. And most of the people living in informal settlements live in a uh, vulnerable uh, way, uh, but they are in, in an urban uh, context with around, they have all the service, uh, and all the um, the houses uh, for living in, in better uh, situation, but the villas that that's how we call informal settlements in Buenos Aires in the city 
uh, live in an urban context without all the benefits that this urban context brings to the other people in the city. The next. <clears throat> Uh, the other reason is to uh, bring uh, services and life conditions uh, to the population <coughs> and the community living in the visas. Uh, they are lacking service uh, services, um, uh, conditions for for better health and assistance in extreme events, and also they are not being uh, the priority actors in the decision making uh, of the policies in, in the city and in the country. Next. Uh, and another thing is that we think that everything is has to be done in these places in enforcement settlements and uh, is the opportunity to change the way of doing things because um, uh, there's a lot of investment to, to set in informal settlements, and this investment has to change the way of doing or making the city, and we have the opportunity here. Uh, this is an um, imagine of uh, how the, the Villa Veinte uh, was at the first moment when the uh, reurbanization process began six years ago. And the second figure B is the meta where the, the, the informal assessment has to, to get uh, to include uh, social and urban uh, in, in the city. You know? mm -hmm. uh, and all, everything here is has to be done. We have to open streets to make services, uh, infrastructure. Uh, bring social inclusion to the population. And this is now being done in many aspects in the same way that was done 50 years ago. So it's the opportunity to change uh, the, the construction of the city here. Next. And uh, of course, um, the, the community, the social leaders, uh, they are not in the center of the decisions. Uh, the community is who is the community build the neighborhoods and makes the, the great efforts to improve the place, but they are not in the center of the decision when the, the investments are put in place there. No? So, uh, which are the opportunities we have uh, to change this? The next, please. <clears throat> and the challenge with, we see <clears throat> through our work, um, working in urban labs in the in the Villa in these last two years. The next, please. <clears throat> the first things we we think that. Uh, the, the the traditional way of planning interventions in this case reurbanization process has to be changed through another a framework that takes in account a process that has a, a, a master plan has like a meta of this process but in this process things are uh, decisions are made uh, together with the local authorities, the social leaders and the community to go through this um, long uh, period of uh, investment and produce the change in the reurbanization of the Villa, in this case, Villa Veinte. No, This process project uh, allows to, to to, to share knowledge in between the actors, to, to look for innovation in the, in the implementation of the process. And all of these uh, things has to be done through the consensus building, no? not because one of, the, um, one of the actors of the sectors uh, decided 
uh, not because of the consensus between all the actors involved in this process. The, the next. <clears throat> Another thing that is um, very important, and we were uh, listening of this uh, uh, now in the in the session, uh, the pro producing the collect uh, data in in a different way. No, we are uh, trying to um, implement. We are implementing. In, in the visa, the collect of um, uh, the, the collect of a temperature range, um, and this is going to do with the community uh, putting different thermometers uh, to to take temperature and humidity uh, in the visa. This system is going to produce data that everyone in the community with their phones has the possibility to, to, to consult. And uh, this is the way that the community here, there are 5,000 families living in the Visha, can um, no, no, not only know, but produce data collect, uh, in a collective way. Next. The other thing that's very important is how to share learnings and capacities uh, through the urban labs that are taking place in Villa Vente. Uh, uh, people from the academia is uh, participating, people from the government, local authorities, social leaders and community are participating. And we think that it's so important people from the community and learning a lot from the academia and experts, but also experts, the academia sector is learning a lot about uh, the real life in the community through um, uh, the, the social leaders that are participating in, in the labs. So we think that the horizontal way of sharing knowledge um, is, uh, is what brings the integration of a, an issue that is very difficult to, to include in the demands that is climate change because the social movements and the community is going through, through other demands and speaking about climate change is not so easy, but uh, when we start uh, working uh, with this project in Vigevente, we think that it was going to be impossible to introduce this um, this issue and knowledge through, of climate change, but it was um, a process of integration. All the things in Visa, the the, tra the the living conditions, the the health conditions, and the social conditions were integrated all with the issues of climate change. And now uh, social leaders uh, and experts has um, the same, uh, the same uh, narrative about the process. Uh, uh, and that is why we think that the horizontal uh, learnings are important uh, in this process to change things. No? The second, the next. The other thing is learning by doing um, that we think that uh, is important to to change things. No, uh, it's not about uh, capacity, formal capacity building or formal sharing knowledge. It's about sharing knowledge and learning through doing and implementing actions that change uh, the city of the or the place. Uh, in different part of the vision. Next. <clears throat> and, and of course, um, one of the, the opportunities we have is to introduce natural-based solutions and blue-green infrastructure in a reurbanization process in the city, but it's not too, so easy to done. 
because uh, we have some uh, rules, norms that uh, that were written by 50 years ago, and it it's not so. <clears throat> and these norms does not available the introduction of other kind of in infrastructure, um, and this is. Uh, a, a, a transition moment to start changing these things uh, and introduce um, uh, different uh, path or streets in the visa so in to, to show that things can be done different no? the next uh, another situation is the, mantain the, the maintenance of these communal spaces uh, at the same in the same way that infrastructure cannot be changed in many places. Maintenance communal sp spaces uh, cannot be changed because of the ways that they were made along all these years, and nothing. Uh, Nothing is is easy to change. No, so it's another issue that we have to work on. The next. So, um, well, we think that we have to change the education, educational and productive matrix and the status quo of the public works because everything is going on in the same way and it's um it's a moment to change through education and through the productive uh, way of doing things to change the way that cities uh, and in this case informal settlements must improve their uh, life conditions of life um, and also coordinating uh, investment and decisions to make uh, citizens resilient and inclusive for all the community uh, of the cities. Uh, and this is the last one, I think. Thank you so much. Um, um, I'm not sure it's fine, but I would really like to get your thoughts and reflections on this. I and mean, it's from, from both contexts. I think the thing that's most striking is, is how often the, use, the word opportunity was, was used. The amount of opportunities, the space to kind of create new entry points to tackle old problems as we start to think about mitigation. But I guess like mitigation might be a new thing in the context of informal settlements, right? We'll be looking at spirit and tackling the same old problems. Um, these are going to be the issues that I thought I would mess up, you know, and I know we've been sat with been focused on since the 90s. But um, without having to take up any more time, I mean, I was going to go up five minutes before lunch, I'd, I'd really like to yeah, hear your thoughts or questions, any specific questions you might have to look at the list or any reflections. If you're in the room, I'll just repeat the question back to you here and have the right Thank you very much. I'm Lorraine Jungle. I work at the University of Sheffield and do my postdoc there. I think just uh, reflections, and I've been trying to link to the earlier session. What is really interesting to me is when we bring in community leaders, they tend to take their time to organize themselves, to think, to process things. It doesn't mean that they're not rushing at this time or they're not thinking of privacy emergency and that kind of thing. But then when you then take the top-down approach, in most cases the timelines are very fixed and rushed. You bring kind of financing there. It has to be done within a certain time. But when you look at resilience, it's a long-term process. You're trying to think the future. So the idea of thinking the everyday that was talked about and trying to link it, you know, to the future is something that is so demanding on those communities that have to do with everything. So I don't know how 
but that can be something that can be combined because this element of time, yes, climate emergency, but we have to slow down, we have to focus. And often, what I also notice, especially with the multilateral development groups, corporations like the Nation, World Bank, and other places, they seem to not factor in that when they're approaching communities, communities need time to even process the vocabulary that they are building or introducing into these spaces to process what it is that has to, um, you know, they need to make sense of something that is coming from outside, which they're already experiencing anyway, but it comes as something new because we're using certain technology, certain certain vocabulary. So I think at that time is really critical. And here also you find they're not approaching just as climate change or climate risk. It's even risk. And so they are combining different things, which again, if we look at the top down, the agenda is very siloed, which is why I appreciated a, a detailed approach whereby we're looking at finance, innovation, because it is critical that we need to do that. So that's some of the learning I'm getting from these. Separate spaces globally, yeah. we're talking of, uh, you know, sub Saharan Africa in terms of analysis, and we're talking of uh, Latin American experiences. But there are commonalities to just the basic approaches, splitting things and going back to this. And it's so incremental. I think, and it just brought me back to accumulated resilience, one of uh, David's paper, several, but a paper that he wrote in 2010. Accumulated, accumulated resilience. Nobody really sets out to say we need to build, fine, we need to be climate resilient, but if we have these other things in place, they will help in terms of climate resilience because it's a process, the long process. I will even say adults are gone for everything. Thank you. Any other comments from the room? Uh, thanks very much. I really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, so they say a couple of things that come to mind and I have also seen very the ones. And so when you highlight basically bottom up and the process of data collection, but also learning by doing these two things can bring to me the idea of open space for new representation, which is the one that I see the space of decision-making in terms of breaks. And second, I think ideas of not only the knowledge distribution, but also basically the the actual relationship they're doing to produce representation, right? So but to effect change, we need this cross color relationship, right? So so people that don't have a space to have a, the ability to be transferred that could change the position of power. But I wonder, you know, using these transformative spaces, if like if if you can actually share something like uh, what has been affected with really those relationships across the space. So this might be so the question I guess for uh, Flo and George. Um, who can to it? Uh, have you got any reflections on the sort of relationship uh, that you've established across scales or institutions to enable change? That, that might be. <laughs> Thank you for the question. So what we have also done as part of uh, the processes around data collection, for example, is also bringing in multiple actors in terms of uh, the data collection processes. So example, for example, partnering with the, is the state in terms of the local government, and also more recently even partnering tertiary institutions as a way of also even legitimizing the, the data that is collected, but also besides just legitimizing, also building relations. Because uh, for a very long time, the data that is collected by communities has been contested in some instances by the state. So co-producing the data has been one of the ways of ensuring that the data is also refined, but also as a way of strengthening relations, strengthening uh, partnerships between communities, or bottom-up bottom processes with the central government and local government institution together with academic institutions. And they even then go beyond just collecting data. It also even in some instances proceed to 
pilot or experiment interventions that emanate from the findings that we have uh, come out of the data collection processes and all the way use that experience to strengthen further the relationships. I don't know if I addressed you. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. We do get the final minutes. Um, yeah, so I guess just to say, we're, we're on a the journey with this. We have dialogues that are ongoing, especially if you have a new that we have to call out for at the moment. Um, we're looking to get a lot of people trying. So if there's something that you're interested in, please do reach out um, as we try to yeah, so create an agenda. Because we don't have to do that. We have to sort of speak into the, the, those, um, the, the experiences of the art. We do very much an advocacy agenda to the extent that we can do two weeks research agenda. So after that, I'm going to hand over to the teacher. Um,